but put yourself in situations where you are doing take action and then you will figure out you know where to where to go next you'll have a more informed decision for whatever your next step is What's up, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Mindset Podcast. On today's episode, we are joined by Matt Bojo. I'm really hoping I'm, I'm pronouncing that you correctly. Nailed it. You <laughs> uh, nailed it. Matt is a fellow podcaster, entrepreneur, and keynote speaker, and not to mention founder of Acton Placer Academy Schools. And you could tell us more about that. But Matt, without further ado, welcome to the show. Thank you, man. Pleasure is mine. I love what you guys are doing. I love seeing, uh, you know, young guys get out there and, and hustle, man, and, and not take the entitlement route. They're taking, taking the, let's put some hard work in and play the long tail game. So it's a, the pleasure is absolutely mine. Absolutely. We're, we're here to work out, you know, work this out, grind and, and go forward, right? We don't like taking a backseat. We're, we're of that mindset uh, to go forward and do what Beautiful. nobody's doing. Uh, Beautiful. I know you're all about that. And we're going to touch on that in, in just mm -hmm. a second. But we do have a round of warm-up questions for you, just so our audience can get to know you a little bit better. Uh, cool. Disclosure, we didn't send this to Matt, so Matt has no idea what the question <laughs> is going to be. That's uh, right. The first one is a little tough. It's going to be a little okay. tough. I hope I don't put All you right. on the spot here. Uh, no worries. You have a podcast called The Sensual Eleven, uh, yep. one of my favorite podcasts, too. And you've had some really great guests. I mean, just yeah. to name two, Gary Vee and David Goggins, well, two yep. of my favorite uh, people that I listen to on, yep. you know, religiously. Who, and it doesn't have to be those two, but out of the guests that you've had on your podcast, if you could only pick one as your favorite guest, who yeah. would it be? Ooh, that's a good one. So, um, you know, Seth Godin may be my, may be my favorite. And that was one that as I went into it, uh, super selfishly, he was one of the, one of the guys that I wanted to contact. And he was very specific that he wanted episode 50. That was the number he wanted. So I had this element of looking forward to that one too. And he definitely didn't disappoint, man. So Seth Godin um, still may be my number one, but I just did one uh, a couple weeks ago too with a gentleman by the name of Patrick Bet David, uh, if you know who he is, and founder of PHP and, and Valuetainment. Um, it's one of the podcasts that I listened to as well. That was another one that may go down as, as possibly the best episode yet. So, um, but man, it, I walk away from every single conversation going, oh, that was awesome. And I take little tidbits away and, and I hope everybody else does too, you know? So and so how, often, how often do you record your episodes and how often do they air? Yeah, we, we try, my schedule is so sporadic between running, you know, multiple campuses and the other businesses that I have. And so um, we try to record and release three episodes a week. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So it is, wow. we're, it's because again, all the money that we bring in um, sponsorship wise goes directly to students. Uh, you know, hundred percent of it goes to students. And so we want to continue to, that's a key driver for some of our kids that, that can't necessarily afford, you know, our program and what we do. So um, I want to be as prolific as possible with that because it only helps them. Absolutely. No, that's amazing. And like Anthony said, we're big fans of your podcast. Um, we, we got into this podcasting world not too long ago, like we mentioned in January. And one of the things that we really struggled with was the name. Um, mm -hmm. we, we wrestled with the, you know, the idea of what to name our podcast. We, we mm -hmm. looked up so many different things, the essential 11. I'm curious to know what's, what's the meaning behind it and why did you choose the essential 11 as the name of your podcast? Yeah, man. So it's actually got a pretty cool story. So 11 has ended up being kind of this, this weird number in my family, right? So my, uh, my wife and I were married on the 11th. Uh, of October, and then we had our our first daughter Morgan. Her birthday is one eleven eleven. She was also baby number one hundred and eleven, born in the hospital that year. Right, so it was wow. kicking it off. My second daughter is yeah. born on the eleventh. My son messed it up, but it was still the first. Right, <laughs> and so we've got all these ones in our household. And so then one of the things that we we had all that background, and then one of the things that we do at the schools that I own is is we create covenants and and contracts. Um, they're essentially the rules that all the students are deciding they're going to hold themselves accountable to, but then they're going to hold the other students accountable to those as well. They actually hold the adults accountable to those as well. Um, and so we took that home and we created 
uh, some Bodro rules, right? Bodro family rules in the house. We ended up coming up with 11 of those as well. Hmm. Um, so when we went out and set, you know, these, uh, what I did was I did a, a focus group of 1500 youth, uh, and you guys fall in that range, maybe 13 to 22 years old across the country. Right. And said, what are the top questions that you guys would have from people that are just going out and making things happen? And uh, we cultivated all of those questions from the 1,500 of them. And so we decided to get the top 11 answers that we saw most often. And uh, that became our essential 11 questions to drive the, con- you know, the, uh, the, the communication with those guests. So kind of cool. Wow, interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's, that's quite an interesting story. Yeah. Again, Anthony, that was probably one of the hardest decisions we had to make going into this yeah. whole podcasting thing, um, you know, for SEO purposes and all these different type of things. Um, but besides your podcast, I mean, you have so many different things going on. You're, you're a keynote speaker. You've been on Ted talks. Um, mm-hmm. you're the founder and owner of, like I mentioned, Acton Placer, mm-hmm. uh, schools Academy. Um, mm-hmm. how, what, what drove you, what kind of got you to find your passion? How did you know where to go, where to look? Um, and what advice would you give to people? Maybe, you know, our age, 19, 20 years old, looking for that passion. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, cause it's something that we get a lot, you know, is, is, How do I find out what my passion is? And so I always have kind of two answers to that. One, uh, first of all, it doesn't matter. Um, Everybody says, hey, find your passion, find your passion. I I take it from a a more of a Mike Rowe standpoint. Bring your passion to every single thing that you do. Hmm. That's a different, that's a different, you know, that's a different story. When I go outside, I got a nice little ranch here in California. And when it's time for me to go get the weed whacker out, get the lawnmower out, I'm not passionate about yard work. But you bet your ass, I'm going to be passionate about what I'm doing right there. And I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. Right. So bring your passion with you. The second part of the answer to that question is do as many things as possible that are moving you towards something. Right. It doesn't matter if you know yet what it is. Do something productive. Maybe that's reading a book. Maybe that's going out and introducing yourself to somebody. Maybe that's going and doing work for free for somebody in your area while doing the best job you can at, you know, whatever classes you're taking, whatever job you have. If you have extra time, get another job. It's doing that is going to open up the doors to more opportunities. It's going to open up the doors to meeting more interesting people. And then it's going to give you that self awareness of, I really, really like this. I really, really hate this. Both of those are extremely valuable and both of those help point you in the direction of, okay, now how do I fill up my schedule with things that resonate a little more with me, but you're not going to find out until you do stuff. You know, I like what, you know, we were talking offline about Gary Vaynerchuk and one of the things he says, well, you never know what your favorite food is unless you try a bunch of foods, right? And it's, it's really that same concept, right? Do things. So, you know, for me in, in my life, it was the product of, always doing something and trying to make something happen. And I had multiple jobs at the same time and, um, you know, was, was connecting with people even in my hobbies and things like that. So, um, and really it wasn't until I got to Stanford university and started working there that I went, wait a second, I kind of have a propensity for, for liking to speak to people and I'm interested in education. And that's kind of what brought me down the education route. Whereas I became a, you know, a public school teacher and a public school administrator, ultimately private school teacher, private school administrator. And um, then even in the process of that, you know, I really discovered, yeah, I thought that was it, right? Even there, I discovered, ah, I, I, I'm going to take it to a, another level because I started getting asked to to speak at these conferences, which snowballed into, you know, now I, I did 350 keynotes over the last six years for Fortune 500s around the world, right? And not even just in education. Um, and none of that would have happened if I hadn't just started stepping out. And then of course, you know, it brought me down that education rabbit hole, whereas I decided that I've got to do things my way and, and, um, you know, create schools that I think are doing a better job than, than what the traditional program is. So it's all a process of doing man um, and filling up your schedule with stuff that makes sense. That, that was, that was a great answer uh, to say the least. Something yeah. that my parents always taught me growing up since I was little, I was a little boy is whatever you do, whatever it is, if it's, if you happen to be a custodian, be the best custodian in your yep. area, yep. Uh, whatever it is, if maybe, maybe you don't like it. Like you said, maybe you don't like going and taking care of the yard, but just be the best person at that job. Um, and yep. that's how you stand out. That's how you get ahead in life. And of course, by trying different things, you know, that's our it. generation, at least uh, the, some of the students I go to school with, I mentioned I'm the SGA president. So I, I mingle with a lot mm-hmm. of students on campus 
And yep. a common theme that I find, Matt, is people, quote unquote, they tell me, I don't know what my passion is. I don't know what I'm right. doing. Right? right. And because of Gary Vee, because I'm immersed in his content, I yeah. always say the same thing, which, which is what you said. Yeah. Try different things. You don't know yeah. what you like if you don't try it. That's right. That's exactly it, man. So first of all, good on your parents for, for uh, giving you that mindset too, because I see parents uh, failing on the job uh, and I see that nationwide. Uh, I really do. And so good on your parents for, for that message to you, because it's, it's absolutely true. Uh, you know, second thing is, is as you're talking about, um, you know, connecting with these kids and saying, well, they're, they're wanting to, I don't know what my passion is. My brother, uh, one of my best friends in the world, phenomenal human being. Um, I remember years ago, he'd be like, man, you know, uh, right, right after I connected with my wife and she and I started dating, he's like, and I'm like, man, I think this is the lady. I think this is the one, I think I'm going to lock her down, you know? And, mm. and he's like, man, I wish, I don't know what's going on, man. I can't find a woman. I can't find a girl. And this was pre like Tinder and all this stuff. Like there was no apps, right? Like that stuff didn't exist. So he said, oh, man, I just can't find her. But then he'd spend his entire, you know, when he wasn't working, he'd come home and just play video games and sit on the couch. I'm like, do you think she's just going to show up and knock at the door? <laughs> right. Go put yourself in situations where you're going to meet other human beings. Right. You have to put yourself there. Otherwise, of course, you're never going to find her. Right. Same concept. Again, right. put yourself in situations where you are doing, take action and then you will figure out, you know, where to, where to go next. You'll have a more informed decision for whatever your next step is. Absolutely. Why don't you tell us, Matt, a little bit more about acting? Tell us what it is, why you got started, how yeah. you got started in that. So far from the research that I've done, I absolutely love the concept, the whole entrepreneurship mindset, yep. uh, the whole uh, self, self-reflecting. self I love it. It's different from the traditional schools. Uh, For which, sure. Which my second question to that would be, have you been getting pushback from the traditional schools, the system that we're in? Yeah, for sure. So uh, Acton is is an amazing global network of entrepreneurs, not unlike myself, who are complaining about traditional schooling by creating something that we think is vastly better. Right? And so it's this network of individuals who, when we do something on our campus, say we create a project on our campus and we implement that project, we document it, we figure out what was good, what was not good, what would we change. Uh, and then we take that project and I will just, I will give it to everybody else right i'll give it to everybody else in the network they can take a look and say do i want to do this do i not want to do i want to modify it right they can so it's this continuous feedback loop of of trying to get better all of these educators and we're putting systems in place to essentially like you said give students that entrepreneurial mindset that doesn't mean we need them to be entrepreneurs we do not not everybody should be an entrepreneur right but everybody benefits from that mindset Absolutely. of understanding how to provide value understanding that adaptation is a necessary thing and so when you have to do it you do it learn how to learn learn how to see what's relevant what no longer is how to lead how to communicate all of those things that good entrepreneurs do are valuable whether you're the number one or the number 100 right so we're giving them that responsibility and that's the key thing is we're giving them real responsibility we are treating them like adults and we are teaching them to self-direct so that they don't come out at 22 years old just playing school trying to get a job going i don't know who i am i've never actually done anything just tell me what to do and as soon as i do that one thing then tell me the next thing to do right they just play school and outsource their thinking we're eradicating that entire thing um, and so you know our, our schools are set up to essentially create irrelevant adults you know i tell our parents the ideal day on an acting campus is that none of the adults show up the kids don't notice they don't care and nothing changes because they're that good at self-directing they're that good at creating their own goals they're that good at moving themselves forward right that's what we are trying to get to that's where the pushback comes in because teachers their job and again i say this lovingly as a former teacher as somebody who still works with teachers who's some of my dearest friends are still teachers they have to justify their job, but their job, what they learn is to manage a system. You learn to perpetuate the system as is. Yep. You don't learn how to actually guide human beings to be these self-directed individuals, because if you did that, you kind of work yourself out of a job, hmm. right? If you really did it well, it's like a doctor. If a doctor is really doing a good job, they make it so that their patients never, ever need them, right? right. Because they just understand how to be healthy and they never have to go. Yeah. Right. So 
but of course they're not going to do that. They learn to perpetuate the system too. So what medications can I put you on? How do I keep you half dead, half alive in perpetuity so I can continue to make my money, right? So it's the same thing. So, you know, the system is what I always fight back against. It's not the individuals. The teachers are phenomenal people. But when I talk about these things, the teachers a lot of times feel like I'm attacking them and their livelihood, right? Their mission. Um, that's never the case. I, I have the biggest heart for them in, on the planet. You know, it's but it's the system that's at the enemy. Yeah. So when are you going to open one up in Miami? I know I'm too old Man. for uh, college. Uh, I'll tell you, oh, dude, well, I'll tell you what. We've already got the MBA program, and we are working on our post-high school program right now. Oh, so. Wow. Yeah, it's a legit, it's a legit project. So I, I'm not sure what the time frame is on that because there's a bunch of us working on that globally. But um, you know, it's it's something that we're putting together. So and and I could I'll legitimately check, man. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I do. I want to say there is somebody working on getting something up and running in the Miami area that I just met um, oh. at the global conference. I believe I believe there is someone uh, working on that, which is great. Yeah. That's, yep. that's super exciting. I mean, I, I'll go back to high school if that's the case. If you guys are opening down, dude, me Miami. too. No <laughs> lie, me I would, too. Honestly, and and for sure. back to your point. I mean, coming from a traditional public school system, it's funny you mentioned it. If if a teacher didn't show up for 10, 15, 20 minutes, the kids would go crazy, right? Yeah, they sure. would they would go home. They would they would walk around. They would leave class. They would. It's a free day. Right. Yep. And, you know, that's for a lot of students, uh, at least in my generation, we've grown up like that. Yep. And it's it's amazing. And it's so refreshing to see, you know, these, this new generation growing up and going to school that, you know, not again, to your point, they don't have to be entrepreneurs, but they're so laser focused on their own goals that they don't need someone yeah. telling them what to do. Yep. You know? Yep. It's that and focus on personal so, responsibility. Yeah, it's it's amazing, honestly. And, yeah. and I'm this is something I'm really passionate about. Again, Anthony and I talk about it all the time about how the traditional school system, basically the way it's set up is, is to, to tell each and every individual, each and every student that comes from all different walks of life, all different interests to, to take one test standardized for, for everyone, right? But you know, to put it in, in lamer terms, you, you get you know, an elephant, a tiger, a lion, a fish, and tell them all to climb a tree. You can't right. do that, right? It's, 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 not the same, it's not the same process. Everyone is different. Um, exactly but I guess right. you know, I'm curious to know, let's say Acton was in place when you were 18, 19 years old, or when you were in mm -hmm. high school for that matter, mm -hmm. how much do you think that would have benefited you growing up and, and to your success today? I mean, it would have been, you know, it's one of those, I, I've thought about that before and it's one of those catch 22s, right? Because um, the reality is there is no, you know, I've had parents that are like, well, my kid does fine in traditional school. First of all, <laughs> whatever, I don't want my kid to be fine. I want my kid to go crush life, right? So fine sucks as far as I'm concerned. Second of all, just because your kid does fine in school doesn't mean that they have anything to offer the world or do they know him or herself when they leave, right? I always, I tell my parents, you know, the, the people that come through our doors to, to tour our school, I got straight A's all through school. I, I got straight A's all through high school uh, and didn't have to work very hard at it. I just figured out the game early. It's not that I'm all that smart. I just figured out the game. Right. And I know people, so I could figure out, okay, this professor or this teacher wants to see this. And, and so I got my straight A's. Uh, but then I came out of high school and was like, now what? Right. Like, I don't know. I don't know anything. Actually, I don't know. I've never done anything. I'm good at sports. I'm good at talking to girls. Like, congratulations. What do I, I so I guess I'll go to college. Uh, and I went to college and guess what? I got straight A's in college and figured right. out the game. And then I came out and guess what? I was better at sports and I was better at talking to girls, but I still didn't have anything to offer the world. But now I'm in debt mm. and I'm going, now what do I do? Right. And so it's this catch 22. If I had had an acting, would I have been more laser focused and had an awareness of who I was? Would I had more to draw on in, in terms of experience and um, you know, what I have, I've gotten to, you know, some of the good stuff faster. Sure. But then of course, you know, the, the flip side of that is what I've met my wife, what I've met, you know, none of that would have happened had I gone down that route. So I'm thankful for the route that I had, but, um, you know, again, preparing this younger generation, man, I want them to have the best opportunity. And, and right now this is one of the best opportunities I think that's out there. I can't even tell you how many times Gabe and I have discussed dropping out of college, like on a serious note, I believe it. I've, 
I, I I'm serious. I'm, I'm serious about that because Gabe has a very successful marketing uh, company that he just started, and he's getting his awesome. way with that. And it's going real well, thank God. And then I'm a realtor. I'm a real estate agent. My family has Good a real estate company, so we both have our, our side hustles that we're doing with yep. school. And we yep. have seriously thought about just stopping college and then just focusing full time on our on our side hustles and making yeah. that a full time hustle because we yep. know we would make a ton more money if we would do that. And we yeah. enjoy, I enjoy real estate. Gabe enjoys marketing. So I've thought about it so many times. So a school like yours and, and what you're instilling over there with, with your community is fantastic. And I applaud you so much for that. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Yeah. And we've seen, you know, our students have come out and some of our kids want to go to college. So great. So they'll go to college if they have a particular reason for it. Um, that's what I, that's always my pushback is cool, man. College, let's go. We'll figure out how to get you in. And that's not actually a very hard game to play. But why? Mm -hmm. Why do you want to go? What is it? What's the benefit? What's the cost benefit? What's the, I'm not against college. I'm against a bad investment. So what is the, you know, what's the ROI on, on you going out there? Because we also have partnerships with programs like Praxis. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Discover Praxis at all, but um, phenomenal place. So post high school, these kids go, they do a six month boot camp um, virtually gaining real marketable skills. And then they have a six month paid apprenticeship at a startup somewhere in the country it's paid more than the cost of the program so you come out net positive 97 percent of them roll into a full-time gig in an area that they're passionate about within the first year oh my god one year debt free and you've got a great job like my so my podcast that, that we produce all i do is talk i don't do anything else for it. i don't do any of the marketing for it. i don't do any of the you know the upload the editing i don't do anything for it i have a person who's a Praxis grad who is now one of my full-time employees and she does the whole thing right so she came out young she's your age debt-free makes you know has a great job and so there's other great there are great programs out there like that that um, you know people should call it fine just figure out why absolutely yeah. and I want to pick your mind a little bit this is a question that we ask all of our guests and every yep. single one I'm telling you has a different answer to this uh, and the question is how do you define success <sighs> You know, I, I used to, I would say something along the lines used to, um, you know, being able to do, it's kind of being able to do what you want when you want. Right. Mm. It's, it's all like having all of those options available. And uh, I don't think that's necessarily the end all be all. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily the world we are moving into. I always try to, people don't pay attention. Right? People don't pay attention to the world around them as it is. People don't pay attention to the world as it's moving. People long for the way it used to be, and they try to create a world that's no longer there, right? They try to live. People live in nostalgia, which I get, and I appreciate nostalgia, but people live there and make decisions based on that without paying attention to what the hell is actually going on, right? So I think especially the way the world is moving now, for better or for worse, and, and I think in some ways it'll end up being both. Um, but I don't think you will always have the ability to do what you want when you want. I don't know that that's always gonna be an option for everybody. I think that's an American concept because we've been so blessed for so long and I don't think that's necessarily always gonna be there. So in my head, success, uh, what really circumvents all of that is just the ability to be content in whatever. Right. It's the ability to get up and you look for better, for worse. Nobody else is speaking into my brain and I'm happy. I can take on challenges and be calm with it. Right. I can be relaxed. I can be stoic with it. I can take the good and enjoy the good and fully enjoy the good, but not get too high so that when something else comes, there's, there's this crash. Right. It's this almost stoicism of being uh just kind of having this calmness inside and that's far easier said than done um and it takes a lot of work to not let yourself get too stressed out over something not let yourself get too excited over something just to have you know this calmness and contentness but i think if you get to that point of contentment um it, it's hard not to say you're successful at that point because every day is valuable and you just enjoy right. it yeah, absolutely it's, that's really for me that's what success looks like yeah i'm glad i'm glad you 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 said contentment because i feel like a lot of people me included at first i i i confuse contentment with happiness and yeah. i i learned that happiness it's an emotion it's right it, you can have it today and it could be gone right. tomorrow you right. know being content and having contentment is 
is being joyful. I always like to say it's a success mm-hmm. to me. My definition of success is it's a journey, not a destination. Right. I, people, people nowadays, our society, they put a, a price tag on success. Once you, once you're on, on stages and, you know, people are looking up to you and you have millions of followers, you know, Anthony and I, we consider ourselves successful now because we can wake up every day of the, uh, uh, of the week and enjoy what we do and be content in, in what we're doing. You know, you and it's, it's so, again, I feel like success has been thrown around. This word has been thrown around so loosely nowadays. Oh, I just want to be successful. Sure. I just want to be happy. I just want to be rich. It's not all about that, you know? At all. all and you said it. I mean, you said it. You can get up every day. You can do what you enjoy doing, right? There's a peace that, that comes with that that, uh, that a lot of people just don't have the opportunity to obtain, you know? And I, uh, that really hit home for me. I told you I've been, you know, I've done a lot of keynotes and, and we were on, uh, you know, I had, a, I had one client where we were doing multiple states for their financial institution uh, in multiple days. And so we were jumping on uh, a private jet that was owned by the president of the bank, right? And so we're jumping on his jet and we're traveling. And um, it, it, one of our trips back and forth on a number of states, we got into some deeper conversation and he kind of started breaking down and he just was not at peace with himself. He didn't, you know, life was, had been kind of handed to him. He had kind of been laid out that he was going to be taking these steps. And, and, you know, from looking back 30,000 feet, I mean, the guy had it all. The guy was the president of a, of a phenomenal company. We're flying on his private jet um, and he's breaking down and going, man, this is not, you know, I just don't feel fulfilled. I'm not happy. I'm not, you know, that, and, and that's not abnormal, you know, that's, that's more par for the course than I think people realize. So you can, you can become content at any time. It really is a, a you know, it's a decision. It's a tough decision and it's something you have to practice consistently until it's part of who you are, but it's a decision you get to make. You, Matt, you have a unique mindset, the way you talk, the way you express yourself, what you're doing, it's, it's different. Nobody would dare to do what you do because it's risky. It's risky. And I'm sure you can admit that. Um, who influenced you to be who you are today? Who, why are you the person you are today? That's a, um, you know, I can give the, I can give the, the fortune cookie wisdom that, that still holds true of the culmination of all of these experiences. Right. I mean, I think there are, there are a number of experiences that I've had that have, that have definitely helped and some good, some bad. And I've learned from them all, everything from, you know, having an abusive criminal father to, um, you know, uh, getting into martial arts early and learning lessons as a young athlete To I mean, there's all these good, bad, right? All of these things. But if I'm going to look at specific individuals, one of the things that uh, I think some people relate to it, some people get weirded out by it. Have you guys ever read Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill? Yep. Yep. Okay. So one of the things that Napoleon talks about in that book and what I really took away from that, um, and I'm not a, a, a you know, driven by, by monetary things. I'm not driven by, by uh, possessions, but one of the things he talked about was creating a board of directors in your mind, right? And you don't necessarily have had to have met these board of directors, but it's in certain scenarios, you can go to your board of directors and say, okay, how would this person handle this? How would this person handle this? How would this person handle this? I've created these, you know, my board of directors that I've had forever now for various circumstances. I've added people, I've taken some away as it no longer has served me. And um, but two that have always been there, and this is where it weirds people out, are not even real people. They're fictional characters. Wow. But it informs a lot of what I do, right? So Interesting. Mel Gibson's portrayal of William Wallace in the movie Braveheart, mm-hmm. that changed things for me. He changed, like literally that movie, him saying, you know, every man dies, not every man really lives. And I'm seeing this as a 14-year-old kid. That literally started to shift my mindset. And then there was also a book that was also a movie called Fight Club. You guys may or may not have seen it, but mm-hmm. Tyler Durden, right? The, the fictional character there, his outlook on truly being happy with nothing. You, see, you know, once you have, once you've lost everything, you're free to do anything. The reality that he was so content with nothing and the reality that what anybody else said, thought, what it, absolutely had zero bearing on who he was as a human being what other people thought was none of his business right and it was those it's those two characteristics that i've got to say those two guys have never left my board of directors 
and I attribute a lot to practicing those concepts from a, a very early age to where now they are literally just a part of me and I, and I, I attribute that to a lot of the peace that I have in my head wow we've never gotten an answer like that before yeah, I can tell you that yeah, much probably not <laughs> and, and probably never will again that's awesome <laughs> you, know, you know we're obviously big fans of Gary Vee you've interviewed him so you know him uh, well something that he says a lot that fascinates me and I, I wanted to get your input on this Matt is he says something along the lines of, don't quote me, but he says something along the lines of everyone walks around like they're coming back. You know, people are alive, but mentally they're gone. They're yep. done. They clocked out yep. already. And, yep. they're, and they're probably 20, 30, 40 years old, a lifetime ahead of them, but they're, they sure. clocked out. They got sure. into the system that it's, it might be too hard to get out. Yep. What, what do you think? People live in fear. You know, and that's one thing that I've, that I've realized over and over again, people live in fear. And I've, uh, the more I've worked with people around the world, whether it's from an organizational standpoint, whether it's working with students, whether it's working with these parents and that's K through 12 university, it doesn't matter. The majority of people on this planet live in fear of something. Now, a lot of them live in, uh, they have a number of fears and, and the media helps perpetuate it. And whatever the fear of the day is in the media, they own that as well. And then the fear of the day, you know, in their family, they own that as well. And, and people live in this fear. And almost all the time, there is an element of it's a fear of what somebody else thinks about me because I hold that person in high regard, um, you know, higher than I hold my own view of myself right and so it's it's that and I think that's what stops people from um, you know a lot of times taking those risks taking those chances and, and moving forward it stops people from getting to that place of peace because they're putting somebody else's theoretical viewpoints of them half the time they're not even right um, on themselves and they're valuing that so high man it's people live in fear I think that's what he's talking about with that and I fully believe that yeah, I, I agree 100%. And I actually heard something recently. It's funny you say that. I heard something recently that I think, you know, could relate to this. And they said that, like you, to your point, everyone lives in fear. But the people who can really make it out and, and become those successful entrepreneurs, businessmen, doctors, you know, whoever the case may be, they're the ones who can take that fear and culminate it and, and turn it into an ambition and really use their fear into an advantage. And I mm -hmm. found that so interesting because a lot of people – you know, like you said, a lot of people on this planet, they stop at fear. They don't want to, they don't want to surpass that. They're comfortable basically yeah. living in that fear and, yeah. you know, whether they hold other people to a, a different standard and the yeah. people who really differentiate themselves is, okay, I'm scared. Yes, I'm uncomfortable, but let me take this, uh, this situation and turn it into something good to, yeah. to become better and to grow. It's, it's all about That's having a, a growth mindset, but you know, instead of a fixed mindset. That's it. And it's attacking that early on. You know, one of the things that I think, uh, I think it was Will Smith that I, that I saw say this, he said, fear is not real. Danger is real. Hmm. Pay attention to that. But fear is a decision, right? And I fully, fully believe that. And so if people would try to identify what that fear is, right? And, or who that fear resonates from. Sometimes that fear, you know, there's the fear of getting on stage or the fear of, you know, you've got some of these things that are, that are fears of a situation. And then sometimes you have fear of the judgment of another human being, whichever fear you're dealing with, maybe you're dealing with multiple. I fully agree that once you've identified that you are obligated at that point to fix it. You are obligated. If you are afraid of speaking on stage, you are obligated to get yourself in front of as many crowds as humanly possible until that is no longer something that hangs over your head. If you are afraid of what somebody, a particular person thinks about you, you are obligated to go have the conversation with that person, whatever that conversation needs to be, so that you can realize that the reality is you probably made up the majority of that. And oh, by the way, it doesn't matter anyway. Right. You're obligated to take those things on because that's the only thing that eliminates that is you tackle it head on. That's it. I think the second part to that Will Smith quote that you just gave there is everything great is on the other side of fear. He was giving the analogy of, of going uh, parachuting, skydiving. I'm sorry, skydiving. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if you yeah, saw yeah. that. Very yeah. 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 yeah, you've yep. seen it. Everything seen that's it. great is on the other side of fear. Yeah, I'm scared as hell to jump off this airplane. But that's once right. you get down, it's like, oof, I made that's it. That wasn't as bad as I thought. That's it. It, right? it always is. It always is. And you grow from that and your confidence, you do not have true self-confidence unless you have gone, okay, this thing right here, whatever this is, 
makes me a little bit uncomfortable. Maybe I'm even a little bit afraid, but I'm going to do it anyways. Mm -hmm. And then the confidence comes on the other side of that. Right. I mean, it always is that way. I remember the first time I went and, and stepped foot in the cage. Right. And so I, I that was another part of a past life had nine fights in, in uh, mixed martial arts before it, it kind of took off the way it was right in my very first fight I got Bruce Buffer announcing me I got Randy Couture <laughs> and Boss Rutten and Guy Metzger and Ken Shamrock and all these Whoa. OGs of the sport right <laughs> on the side they're all out here on the you know on the side of the ring and I'm going out to fight this other human being and it was the first time ever in that sort of competition on this day and it was like holy crap right <laughs> But as soon as that, as soon as we got done, man, the, the emotion, the high, um, the, the self-confidence that was rooted there, I couldn't wait to do it again, right? Couldn't wait to do it again because you just gain that element of self-confidence that is exactly, um, you know, proportionate to the amount of fear that you had going in. You know, you gain that much confidence on the backside. Yeah. So I, I fully agree with what Will Smith says on that. Yeah. Yeah, and I know you're, you're a big fan of his too, so I'm glad we brought up that quote. Um, yeah. You know, a little story that I have in, in regards to what we're talking about is when I was in high school, we have a morning announcements, right? Like most high schools where you get some students that give the morning announcements. Um, it's called BTV. Um, and w I had an assistant principal, Mr. Ramos, who he really believed in me. He really helped me while I was in high school. I was never great at public speaking. I, I didn't like it. I was uncomfortable like most people. Sure. I was afraid of getting up on stage and you know, my voice cracking or whatever. Um, and he really pushed me to be on the live on the do the morning announcements. It's on camera. It's a full studio with the real uh, projectors. And, and, you know, we had like 2000 kids in the school at that time. So 2000 kids are watching me girls, you know, girls that I like. Yeah, are watching man, me. For sure. <laughs> like, it's really, like the situation right. is intense. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm definitely not doing that. I, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. Don't risk it. yeah. Yeah. He pushed me and I did it. And not only did I become uh, very good, in my opinion, I did really well. I, they, they asked me to come once a week, then it became twice a week, and it became yep. three times a week, and I did really well. And look at where we are now. Now we have a podcast right. that requires right. me to be on camera, to right. have hundreds of people listening to me. So it really set yep. me up for success, and I owe it to him. I was scared, and now you know I'm SGA president. Now I give speeches to a large amount of people. It, it's right. funny how one thing sets off a chain of, of effects of, of yes. the city. Yeah, that's exactly it. And you do a very good job. You're a very good communicator, you know, mm -hmm. as it is right now. It's a big deal. And so, yeah, you do owe part of it to him uh, and shout out to him for believing and pushing. And that's what good educators do, right? You also owe it to yourself mm -hmm. because you didn't back out. You didn't quit. You didn't say no. You didn't step off. You went ahead and went through it. And then you went back and you did it again. And then you went back and you did it again, right? Mm -hmm. So that's it. It's not, you know, we want to... Uh, over systematize a whole lot of things and, and make everything this esoteric, um, you know, crazy, this lucky, this, what, no, man, you showed up, you did it. And then you kept going back. And so every single time, you know, the next time you do a podcast episode after this, it'll be better than this one too. Cause yeah. you'll just keep getting better. You know, I, yeah. I look at talks that I gave you, I go watch the Ted talk that I did in 2015. And I'm like, dude, who is that chump on the stage? <laughs> I'm like, dude, that guy sucks, you know, but it's just, and, and in a joking way, you know, I'm so grateful right. for the experience, but I look back and go, okay, well, if I was to do that again, obviously I've done 500 of them since then. So it's a different mm -hmm. story, right? It's, right? it's just the way it works, man. So good for, good for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. And so something again to your point with something anthony and i talk about all the time and usually we, we chat a little bit after after each episode and we're like man like that it wasn't perfect it wasn't you know and i told them we were talking the other day and i'm like i don't i don't ever want to get to a point where it's it's perfect you know because then it, once we get to that point that it's perfect that's it we can't get any better you know it's right it's You'll do every, it forever every day yeah every every episode like you said every episode we're going to be, be getting better we're going to be yeah. improving we're going to you know our communication skills are going to be you know yep. just gradually getting better and for sure that's that's the grind that's the process it's enjoying the process and again like we talked about earlier you know again to anthony's point we he he didn't stop at fear like most of the people yep. living on this planet today he overcame the fear and he kept coming back and he really took that fear yep. and took advantage of it and and culminated into something a lot bigger yeah you did, if you if you ever get to the point where you get off and you're like man nailed it perfect 100 percent, nothing wrong there you need to check your mindset because yeah. there's no such thing right it just isn't yeah. and so you'll always if you're doing your job accordingly you will always get off and be like oh ugh, right there should have said that should have asked this yep. should have pressed that should have like it'll always be there 
it'll always be there. Always. Um, so, and that's a good thing. Then you yep. make a note of it and think about it and go, okay, got it. Reflect on it, figure out what that means for the next time. And then you move forward. Matt, you're just scratching the surface with everything that you're doing. Uh, you're a young guy. What's next for you? What does the next chapter in your life look like? Yeah, we've got, um, it, it was kind of uh, providential, I guess, in a way. This year, 2020 was the year I was going to die down the speaking a lot. You know, I was doing 50 to 60 speaking gigs a year. Um, which is a whole lot of airplane time, you know, and yeah. so I was already planning on dialing those way back. Uh, the whole COVID situation went ahead and, and helped make sure that I did that. Uh, <laughs> so that's, so that was fine. Um, so we've got this campus here in, in uh, Roseville, which is just east of Sacramento here in, in California, but we also just purchased uh, a new campus in Sacramento itself. Um, and so this year is going to be spent building up the community there so that we can launch that, cap that campus in uh, fall of 2021. Um, we just finished production on a movie with uh, Dennis Prager and Adam Carolla called No Safe Spaces about things that are going on on college campuses. So, um, you know, we're yeah. looking forward to, to doing some more work around those. Uh, Gary and I are putting together uh, an entrepreneurship camp uh, for teens in the Sacramento area that we're going to be doing next summer. Um, we are probably going to launch another three or four campuses here in the area. And then um, the next thing that's kind of most urgent right now is I'm putting together a virtual program for young men ages 13 to or, you know early 20s, somewhere in there um, with, I don't know if you're familiar with Tim Kennedy at all. Um, and uh, his former UFC middleweight, uh, Army Ranger, Sniper, Green Beret, just kind of all around badass. He's got a whole group of dudes called Sheepdog Response. So we're putting together a program for young men that we're going to release this fall. So, uh, wow. you know, I'm still in that same mode of, man, fill up your plate, all right? Give yourself so many things to do. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a very fulfilling way to go. So we got a lot, a lot on the plate and, and uh, couldn't be happier about it. Well, wow, Matt, I mean, again, what an amazing conversation. I took so much away from it. And you're, again, like Anthony said, you're not even scratching the surface of what you're doing. I mean, from the keynote speeches to act in. And I mean, again, go to go back to the beginning of the podcast. I mean, you're a father first. I'm sure you can attest to that. And, you know, you're a blessed man. And, and I'm sure that's, that's the title that you want everyone to know you as. And I, I, you have two you have two or three kids. However many kids I end up having, um, they're going to be in acting because I know – uh, they, awesome. you know, they need to have that type of mentality and mindset. Yeah, man. Um, but it was such a privilege to have you on, Matt. It's definitely not going to be the last time. Uh, we'll definitely be hearing from you again. But we, we wish you the best of luck um, in, in your next endeavors with acting and your, your keynote speeches. And you have a, a full plate, as we, can, as we can see. But a lot of success to coming to you, brother. So, again, appreciate it, all the wisdom. I'm sure our viewers are going to take advantage of this and they're going to take a lot away from it. So thank you. Good, man. No pleasure is absolutely mine. Thank you guys for having me. And thank you guys for leading by example too. Um, you know, there's not enough, not enough guys your age that are, that are doing that, that are leading in that way. And so, um, you know, it fires me up to, to meet guys like you two that are out there pushing it. So I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it, brother. You bet, appreciate man. It.